Hello and welcome to Art and Self. I'm Cindy Ingram, your host and the founder of Art Class Curator, the Curated Connections Library, and the Art and Self Connection Circle. This is a podcast where we experience the range and depth of what it means to be human, seen through our connections and conversations about works of art. These art conversations are here to show you that art is here for you as a catalyst, a challenger, a coach, and a comfort. Before we get started, take a moment to fill up your lungs with a deep breath. Connect with your body and your mind and your spirit and get ready to discover what art has to show you. Hello, I am so excited to welcome my friend Nicole Pearson to the podcast. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Me too. I'm very excited. So before we get started with the art, can you tell our listeners about yourself? Yeah, I probably should have thought this through. Um, <laughs> and I have to introduce myself. <laughs> um, yes, my name is Nicole Pearson. So I like you. One of the reasons I was so drawn to being a guest on your podcast is similar to you. I've gone through a pivot recently career-wise. So I spent 22 years as an environmental planner working on environmental projects for government agencies. And in the pandemic, kind of threw a little bit of a wrench for us. We, while government contracting in general increased, a lot of agencies that had to do field work first couldn't get into the field. They were all working from home. So our business kind of took a hit. And I thought, you know, what am I going to do? And, you know, I had some personal things we might talk about today that really shook me up. And so I recently pivoted from doing environmental projects to talking about the environment. So I now write about climate change topics at my website as a blogger. I'm a blogger. Like I have to practice saying that blogger and it's a real job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a real job. I ha- that I started out as a blogger and oh. I had a hard time calling myself a blogger for a while too. Yeah. And my daughter and I were in a store and this girl had asked us, oh, because it was a work day. She said, oh, well, what do you do that you can take the day off? And I Went back to, oh, I'm an environmental planner. I do government contracting. And my daughter, we left and she's like, this is LA, mom. This is the only place where you could say, I'm a blogger. And that girl's going to say, cool. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you. That's so funny. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, oh gosh. I was like, now I, I've added coach to my uh, to my resume. And then the art history major. I was like, I'm just getting all the cliche uh, right. Jobs in one <laughs> blogger, coach, and art history major. I'm like, it's fine. I'm making it work. It's fine. So funny. Yeah. So funny. Awesome. So you you blog at nicolepearson.com. Yeah, nicolepearson.com. Yeah, we'll yeah. put a link to that in our show notes. Okay, so I'm going to show you the art. I'm going to show you four oh, yeah. options, <laughs> and then <laughs> pick whatever one really calls to you. Don't spend too much time on titles, but I do have to warn you. Finding good, I want, you know, I wanted it to be an environmental focus. There's a lot of climate change, environmental art out there, mm-hmm. but it is very, they're very like hit you over the head. It's like, here mm-hmm. is our one big message and we, <laughs> we want you to feel this one way. Mm-hmm. And so they're very, they're all kind of simple without a lot of like digging you can do. So I, I tried to find some that were like more complex than just, you know, a dying polar bear or something, you know, like no, there were some right, that were just right. clearly like, oh, we'll get this in five minutes and be done. So Right, right, right. It was a little bit of a challenge, but I think I, I think I did okay. Yeah, it was just very like obvious what the meaning was, which is what is needed for this situation. You want people to be emotionally charged. You want, although, although I can't wait to talk about this because I have kind of a whole different take about climate change, which is why I'm writing about it. I know, I know. So I'm very excited about this. All right, you've piqued my interest. I'm sure you've piqued the interest of the others too. But let's look at the art first. Okay, so we have. The Order of the Night by Anselm Kiefer. And then we have Unbecoming by Vasilis Avramidis. And listeners will know his art because we've already featured him on the podcast before, but I just had to keep it in, even though we've already covered, he's already been featured. We have Conjecture by Tukrol and Tagra. They're a, an Indian duo, artist duo. And then this one is the, I was telling Nicole before we started that I have kind of a different one, that this one is like an entire exhibition. So I have one artwork here on the screen by Jason DeCares Taylor, uh, but he actually created an, a museum of underwater sculpture and it has over 1100 artworks underwater. 
uh, sculptures. So I just have some other pictures here of some of oh. the other artworks. And then I have just even more that we can look at or not look at, depending on what where did we decide to go. So those are your four-ish oh options. <laughs> oh my goodness. Any of them calling to you? And I can go back and look at one again if you want to, you know, see it closer too. I think still do the underwater one. Okay. That's interesting to me. <laughs> Sorry for and the so these are delay. actually underwater? Yes. So um, let me make this a little bit bigger so we can see it. But the um, the art is, so there is one museum outside of Cyprus that has 1,100 artworks at it. The Museum of Underwater Sculpture of Aya Napa, which is in Cyprus. But there are, he also has these same sculptures all over the world. Like there's some in Mexico. There's some in Spain. There was some in... Um, Obviously, the ocean's outside of these places. So he has them all over the world as well. And then he creates them in a material that is primed for sea life to bury themselves in it, like to create cor new coral reefs and new oh. ocean life. So it's like rejuvenating the oceans at the same time. Oh, well, that's really interesting. Yeah. That's really interesting. Actually, this is a perfect. This is a really good one for, I think. Okay. Yeah, this is a really good one. Now <laughs> okay. my mind is right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So let's, let's, do you want to talk about just this image in particular and kind of uh, interpret it? And then we can, if we still want to go to the other images and kind of interpret like the project as a whole. Okay. That sound good? Yeah. Or yeah. we can go the other way around too. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Let's, let's start okay. here. Okay. So will you describe for our listeners what you're seeing here? Oh. So I'm like the most unartsy person describing this, but <laughs> so it looks like there's obviously water halfway up the image and underneath there's somebody standing looking up out of the water to someone who is standing half in the water looking down. And then in the background, there's walls, but they look maybe decayed or, you know, they're not, they're not complete. You can see through them. There's holes yeah. and, and gaps. And then the picture shows both underwater and above water. I really like that. And yeah. the surface across the top, which reflects the walls around it. Yeah. And it was reflecting the, the man that's standing and the man, above the yeah. water and as then well. The man above the water looks much very ornate, right? Looks, has patterns and designs that mm -hmm. make me think of somebody that's, you know, in art, ornate people tend to be the more wealthy, right? Oh, I know. I think there might be some statement about class here and and uh, in income inequality as well. It's not yeah, class but income inequality. I can I can definitely see that too because the do you see the one at the bottom as a kid too? Oh, I didn't see it as a kid, but that could be. I didn't. It looks like a kid to me, but also it looks like they are black based on the like facial features and the. And the, the hair, hair, right? Yeah. I thought the same thing. Yeah. I thought definitely so, the same thing. It looks like the, oh, what is that called even? The the hairstyle, right? The, yeah. Yeah. So one is looking down. Age, and then right? <laughs> we call words half the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, same. The pattern on the, on the man standing there looks like, to me, it looks like penne pasta put in a... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> a chevron pattern. So just right, a way right. to describe it. It's like this little kind of chevron zigzaggy type of pattern. And then he has like slashes in his face yeah, and all along his arms. And I'm wondering if that's functional as a way for like coral to. Oh, yeah. But so it also could be I, part of the meaning too. Well, and I wonder, is this, so these are, this is an ocean you said, right? Cause it's for yeah. coral. Mm -hmm. So the art would change according to tide, right? So I yeah, wonder I so. if this is high tide, low tide, does the person under the water ever come out or does the person out of water eventually become submerged? Because I feel like that has, that has meaning. Yeah. What right? kind of meaning do you think it has? Well, I, so I think that when talking about the issue of climate change, for sure, there's an income inequality problem, right? There's mm -hmm. a environmental justice issue. And poorer countries, smaller countries on the coast or islands are certainly feeling the impacts first, right? 
and wealthier countries aren't really doing anything about it. We're still just living our lives the way we are. However, if this is at low tide and eventually that person standing out comes, goes underwater, I mean, I think it foretells the future of, you know, yeah. right? Like you may be standing out of the water now looking down upon, which, you know, that person is looking down into the water, looking down upon the people who are already feeling the impacts of climate change. You're not immune to the impacts. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time, which is true. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were saying you kind of have a different view of climate change, what? Yeah. Tell me more. So um, when I had some free time and I started looking into environmental issues, so I've spent 20 some years reading about projects. We read about the environmental impacts of a project that the government is doing. So that specific little project, right? That small mm -hmm. piece of the world. And what impact will that have on the environment as a whole? But after 20 years of doing this, it, I realized, you know, that background that we're measuring this against, it is changing. It is changing so quickly. And so just looking at the impacts of this one project, like I felt really helpless. Like yeah. I'm not making a big difference. Yeah, maybe this project isn't doing something damaging, but it's all changing anyway, right? No matter what. So, uh, so I started looking at climate change and it's, it's really sad. Like if you want to feel depressed and you know, you want to like eat a bowl of pint of ice cream at a time and think mm -hmm. about just giving up and why did I have children? Like go out and read about climate change, <laughs> do it. But in reading, I felt like people were missing a really important message. And that is all the places and countries and people and organizations and businesses that are making big changes uh, in the way that they do business or how they govern and are trying to tackle climate change. Like, so there's a book called Project Drawdown and they look through different things that we could do that and the difference that they'll make. So composting, for example, I had yeah. no idea. If we all composted, we could reduce, I don't even know, gigatons, hundreds of thousands, millions of gigatons of carbon from going into the environment. We can make little changes. And then what they saw was that these changes were also better for the economy, for the people, and for society. So by having to tackle climate change, we're also going to be improving the world as a whole. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So there's like, that w it almost felt slightly uh, hopeful for... <laughs> I'm actually really hopeful. There's a there's yeah. a quote that I wish was mine. I could take credit for it, but it's in <laughs> Chick Drawdown. And he says, climate change isn't happening to us. It's happening for us. Oh. Right? Climate change is making us, it's forcing us to change business as usual. Yeah. But in doing so, if we do it, we will end up on the other side of this in a world that's infinitesimally better than the one we have now or the one that we will have if we just continue the way business as usual. And so there's been a lot of countries that are, are making big changes. And, and like I said, in companies, and I just see so many people, individuals and large organizations that are saying, you know, we have to change business as usual. And, the, and it just the changes that they're making are rippling across um, like you said, across economies and across, uh, you know, if you, you know, we all need clean air, right? So if mm -hmm. we start talking about going to EVs, electric vehicles, and we stop, we get rid of um, carbon, you know, gas powered vehicles or any sort of zero emission, right? It doesn't have to be just EVs. It could be hydrogen or something. Um, we also clean the air. We also have mm. better air quality, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's just, there's so many amazing solutions that if we looked at them, not just through the lens of climate change, because unfortunately, climate change has been very politicized. And there's a lot of, oh, gosh, I don't know if you want to get me started on that, <laughs> on the whole um, climate change denialism and yeah. and where that came from and how it's been funded and uh, the money that's gone into it just to keep money flowing. It's insane. Um, you know, you look at the man standing out of the water, ornate and wealthy yeah, you can keep making profits off of gas-powered yeah. vehicles, but eventually you too 
are going to suffer. Eventually you will be underwater or you will have poor air quality in your city. Um, <clears throat> if it's not you, it's your children or your grandchildren, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I just think that if we could even step back and say, okay, I'm a climate denier. I don't think it's getting fine. Okay. I'll meet you there. Well, let's talk about putting solar power on your home so that we can decentralize the electrical grid. So yeah. we are no longer beholden to power companies, utility companies. I mean, you're in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> we went through some stuff. Oh, yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, we right? did. If we had been working towards solar power and had been collectively saying, hey, this is the choice, this is the right way to go, not just for the env environment. But because we can decentralize the power grid, the consumer becomes the generator and can sell not power only back to utility companies, but to their neighbors or to collective, you know, to, uh, mm -hmm. to groups um, or to your home. All of a sudden, you with solar powers on your solar panels on your home, you can power your home, you can power your car. Every oil company out there now has no power. Sorry, power has two meanings in this sentence. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> I'm following you. Yeah. yeah. When I talk about decentralizing power. I mean, literally and figuratively. Yeah. Right. We can put power out in rural areas now or places in Africa where you don't have to run transmission lines from an electrical generator in a city all the way out. They generate their own power. We don't need to all be connected to this grid. Right. Mm -hmm. I just think when I think about decentralizing electricity and the major companies that which is why they've fought it for so long right yeah because they're smart the enough to have seen this yeah. 20 years ago right yeah and and putting that power i mean as a country you know as a democratic country where we think our only power lies in being able to vote for elected officials no we could be in a world where our power literally is under our control right how yeah. we run our cars how we how are our homes, how we charge our electric devices, everything could be something that we control. Like it's amazing. I mean, I, I tell people yeah. about decentralizing power. I'm like, if you don't, if your mind isn't just like blown, then you're just not getting it. And I'm gonna have to be talking. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think that's why so much of the art is I said I found a lot of art that was about the data, you know, different visualizations of the data. There was one that was like knitted and that was like showing temperature change and there was one that was showing the grid and like the uh, upwards was like fire and then like the downwards was the ice and you know and then so it was yeah. like they're trying so hard to like convince people that yes this is this is real and in right. all these different ways um and, possible and i think they do that that you know you see that in art and you see that in in writing and you see that in mm -hmm. in everybody is saying and even in my writing, I started my starting the articles that I put on early were, hey, this is the catastrophe that we're running towards. Here's how we can protect ourselves. Here's the little changes we can make to try to, you know, the little changes like composting and recycling and, and you know, don't use a coffee cup. And um, these are the little things we can do. And then as I dove deeper and deeper, and you kind of get really deep into the data and the writing and because this is not as accessible i'm thinking holy crap like we could have this world we could create a world where we do have more freedom where people have i mean talk about the american dream and you know can you an income inequality and oh it's so bad and there are solutions out there that solve the climate crisis that also solve income inequality that do create mm -hmm. new jobs you know uh in this country, we fight a lot about coal, right? Mm -hmm. In those coal states, and they like, we don't want to, we can't shut down coal plants because people have jobs. But these people work jobs in coal mines where they get sick and they die and it's dangerous, right? Yeah. Now they could be, they're taking, so under the new uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was just passed by the Biden administration, they're taking those coal plants, shutting them down and giving the money to, um, there's funding to transform those into renewable energy plants or electric vehicle battery production, like yeah. all these things. There's a, so many things that they can be transformed in where people can have better paying jobs doing work that's not going to kill them. 
how can we be mad about that? <laughs> right? <laughs> just, just, your, fa- your father was a coal miner and your grandfather and your great grandfather, and that's your identity. I sympathize with that. Yeah. <laughs> Empathize maybe, but good God, right? Like change is inevitable. And so uh, I just see so much promise. I see so many opportunities, uh, smart grids where your house will start communicating with the electric company and you will adjust its own usage based on demand. You might have your car plugged in or you have a battery pack that, you know, because people will need these long-term batteries, which the government is actually giving tax credits now to buy and Mm. put into your home. And so it will not only power your home at night or if the grid goes down, but it can actually, you can put electricity back into the grid to keep it from going down, right? Like this really connected, it's like science fiction. It's science fiction. <laughs> it is. <laughs> well, it's, it's, we're, right. being forced, we're being forced into science fiction too. It's like that water is climbing up and we have right? to innovate. We have to. And I, I think that, you know, people who are most resistant, I think it's become a, you know, a political identity issue. And again, like, yeah, regardless of your politics, if you live on the coast of Florida, you're going to be underwater in a few years. Well, you could be, you could be. I mean, I, again, I think that reversing our emissions and then pulling, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere also, they're looking for, you know, commercial ways to make a profit off of pulling carbon. So you pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and then what can we do with it? And there's a lot of research right now going into what can we make or what can we, can, you mm. know, produce, right? Not just store it back into the ground, but what can we do with it to make it economically viable? And there are predictions about this being a multi-trillion dollar industry someday. And, you know, a lot of us who are, you know going along with our lives every day who are being told it's do- either doomsday like we're it's over just start eating your ice cream don't don't work out anymore because you know there's no need to jog <laughs> i think we're all dead anyway <laughs> or um, or hey it's a, it's a it's a hoax and it doesn't exist there are these people who are the ones standing outside of the water here who are investing and making money in california there are three uh, electric charging there are three companies that control electric vehicle charging in the state uh, control, but who have invested in and built the infrastructure. Yeah. One of those companies was just purchased by Shell. Uh-huh. Shell Oil Company is now getting into the battery EV charging business. Why? Because that's the future. Shell's yeah. going to be just fine. Everybody who feels sorry for Shell because we're not buying fuel anymore, gasoline, and you know, like, oh, they have to make res- record profits to make up for the whatever. Shell's going to be just fine. So it's time that individually we all think about how can we capitalize on what's coming because there's going to be so many economic opportunities. Which yeah, is a little bit different topic, but yeah. No, that's I. I'm just sitting here just. Taking it all, <laughs> taking it all I know, in. Because I could go on and on and on. I, I, know, know, I know. No, it's so good because I, I guess in my head, I always. It's one of those things that just it feels hopeless, and then I, mm-hmm. and I just look and I'm like, well, you know, it's not. Nothing's going to happen unless we all do something. Nothing's going to happen unless these big corporations do something. And so, like, what power do I have? And and so I just get into the spiral of like complete helplessness like my vote is really all i have and i'm in texas and so my vote right. doesn't necessarily right either no matter who i'm voting for one side's gonna win yeah and that's and i don't know if that's happened because you know we just kind of live in a world where what is it if it bleeds it reads right that's our hmm. so let's give them the bad news because people will consume the bad news who wants to read the solution right who wants to read about the solution um but I do, or so I don't know if it's if it's just that, or if it's by design so that people don't change. Because if I think if you feel hopeless, you're less likely to make a change because yeah, because it, it's hopeless, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Um, and if we were really told uh, the impact, and and you know, I think too, it's 
Change is hard, right? I, I think people don't change until it gets really uncomfortable. I mean, we've all been there, right? Right. You know, yeah. Nobody really changes until it just gets staying the same is more painful than changing, which yep. is kind of, I think, where we are on the cusp of climate change is we're seeing hurricanes and uh, heat waves and wildfire, oh, yeah. right? Um, so I think as a society, a lot of people who maybe who were who were skeptical are starting to say, ah, I'm in the but um, or, you know, or if it's a I just I hope it's not something by design to keep people from changing their behaviors. And, and I do think there is that, you know, again, when you follow the money and you look at some of the oil companies and and some of the concerted effort to uh, feed climate denialism, it's it's really it's shocking. It's shocking. And then that's when I get a little bit, ugh, how am I possibly going to fight? <laughs> how can my little voice be a difference to, to something that big? But um, but I, I do think that, you know, as Americans, we're just such individualists and we're such, um, you know, uh, America has more entrepreneurs than any other country. And I read mm -hmm. somewhere that someone said they think it's because most people who came to America, we were, we were immigrants, right? Yeah. No matter how far back it goes. We all come from immigrants and to leave your home country and everything that you know, and your family and your friends and to venture someplace unknown, you have to have a little bit of ruggedness and an, an adventure and risk taker. You have to be a bit of a risk taker yeah. and that, that may have passed genetically down through generations. And so we have a, we have a whole country of a little bit of risk takers. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I feel if you can talk to people about not just what it does for the climate, but the benefits for them for them themselves, their community, their friends, their families. And again, taking back our power from corporations, which have really held that over us for my entire life. Yeah. When I was born in the seventies, right. The fuel crisis of, you know, the, yeah, the energy crisis of the seventies. And then, I mean, we're still having the same conversations, right? Here we yeah. are 50 years later, still having the same conversations. We don't have to be, we don't have to be. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I know, right? I'm just like, okay, where what do we where do we go from here? This is oh, it's so much. Okay. So let's mm -hmm. let's let's pull it back into the art and yes, sorry, sorry. Oh no, you're great. I I asked you that question because I was like, I can't, I have to, I have to hear the answer to this question. Right. <laughs> it would have maybe come out naturally, but I was like, I just really need the answer to this question. So we've noticed the the income inequality. The, the rising and lowering of the tides, the race view right, the, here. How else are you seeing kind of the stuff that we've been talking about in this in this work of art? So I think when I look at the background, I think that that's what I love. One of the things I love and hate about art is that it's a lot of interpretation. And I'm a scientist yeah. by nature. <laughs> and so I don't like interpretation. I like a, you know, black or white, <laughs> like yes or no, <laughs> up or down. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> I think that my mother's an artist, I should mention. So I grew up my whole life with, you know, interpretation, um, <laughs> which is probably why I, because I rebelled against my mother and became a scientist. Um, <laughs> my hippie mom. <laughs> there <Love> you. <laughs> um, but I, I think that in the background, when you look at those, like we said, the the walls in the background, they have large gaping holes and, and, um, and it's obviously, it looks like, because it's not uh, even and cut, right? It's it's a uh, mm -hmm. what do you call that? Like it's really uneven, wiggly, squiggly like organic lines. shapes. Yeah. Thank you. My, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's your art term for the day. Um, organic shapes. Thank you. Thank you. Organic shapes. Uh, it looks as though it could be decay, right? And so mm -hmm. some might say that our it could be interpreted as saying we are it's just being destroyed, right? It's just a, a yeah. sign of destruction. It's a sign of a decay of you know, breaking down of, you know, like, because climate change is very much like that. It could be mm. also interpreted as a breaking down of the norms, right? Of mm. breaking the walls so we can see through and see out, right? If you've been trapped inside, if those were full walls, those um, figures, at least the one under the water would be inside of it. The person that's standing above looks like almost like in a doorway or something, a, yeah. an opening. But, you know, I think. It could be interpreted as we can see through them now. We can see out. And guess what? There's a whole world out there of possibilities. Mm. 
I love that. And we're look, you know, we're looking out into the sky that from our angle. I mean, I guess from any angle, right. most you're going to be seeing through the sky. This one, yeah, you'd be seeing, right? Um, and so it's vast, right? There's no structures blocking the view of the sky. There's nothing, no buildings or you know, it is just open sky, right? Yeah, it seems like it, it's opening to possibilities, not necessarily a sign of destruction and falling apart. Yeah. And the, yeah, if I'm imagining if that wall were solid, it's like, I think it's made out of, it's gray. So for listeners, it's gray, but I think it's like steel or something like that. It yeah. looks like metal. Looks like a metal. Yeah. yeah. And it's kind of rusted in parts and mossy as it gets closer to the water. But no, notice that mm. I'm pointing at my screen, like you can see my finger, but like you, the mossy kind of yeah. goes up. So it makes me think the tide and then, oh, yeah. you know, look at the top of yeah. him. Yeah. The tide goes up to his shoulders. That. Yeah. Yeah. I think the because tide, I think the head sticks out at high tide. I think you're right. Because you can yeah. see also like on the shoulders, doesn't that look kind of dirty and, mm-hmm. and, and mossy? And Yeah. The penne pasta <laughs> is just a different color <laughs> than it is. That's the official the, artistic the term. <laughs> yeah, that is. That's what they call that, that shape. Yeah. It's a different color. So, oh, that's really interesting. Right. But then, you know, with climate change, the water levels are rising Mm -hmm. and eventually like Mm right now, maybe the top tide is Mm -hmm. to his shoulders, but eventually. What is that? Like just a foot, just a foot more. Yeah. Person would be underwater. So really that person, yeah. At high tide is still safe, but any higher from climate Mm -hmm. change and that person will be underwater. Wow. And I imagine like the, the feeling of the person, like right now the tide is low. It's kind of at his, probably a little bit above his belly button ish. And then at his elbows. And then like right now he probably, he can breathe. He's fine. He's probably, he's okay. But yeah, as it starts to rise, I can imagine that sort of panic. And that's probably what is how we kind of feel collectively is as, as it gets worse and worse, like that panic is going to start. Yeah. Rising. Yeah. One would assume, one would hope, one would hope, I I would, I guess. And I, and I do think, you know, we're seeing that when, yeah, whether it's, I think, unfortunately, rising uh, sea levels is a very slow process. Yeah. Um, But, or I guess, fortunately, um, but things like fire and, you know, for sure, people are starting to feel that panic already. Yeah. Just this past summer, how hot it was. Oh, Um, the heat. It was so shocking. Yeah. Mm. It's like we all, we all realized it, I think for the first time, like, Oh, this is different. This is. Yeah. Well, and then this, the winters we've had in Texas have been so weird too. So. Yeah. So strange. So what do you make of the man's feet? Like he looks like it, his legs sort of billow out to like a fabric or a. And he's standing on a structure, right? So. Yeah. and And I imagine that's just needed in order to have the difference in height yeah. although i do wonder um if you could see it without any water right like yeah. his hands what are his hands what are they doing and then what is he standing on and what does that mean is it just the temporary you know uh, advantage that some people have mm-hmm. we talk again about the inequality is it uh you, you stand on something although it's not very big there's not room for a lot of people on that little yeah, that's true. Where? I mean, it could just be showing his, um, could be like the, his status or also his actual physical elevation. You know, he's not yeah. in one of those islands that's getting impacted. He's physically higher up, higher than sea level. But I can't, yeah, yeah I can't good. figure I, out what's going on with this, I, this fabric. I, I can't either. I think, um, it's something we haven't really talked about the fact that this is from a material and from, and, and done in such a way that, you know, can rebuild coral and fish can mm-hmm. live in it. It can become habitat. That's pretty amazing because, which is such a profound statement. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how people talk. Coral, <laughs> right. <laughs> coral reefs are, um, you know, disappearing and dying mm-hmm. and bleaching and uh, you know, anything that you can do to increase the habitat. And which, who would have thought artwork? Yeah. I think that's what, you know, the artwork could serve as habitat for wildlife. I, I think that's something that we forget as 
non-artists. I think artwork, I think paintings on my wall, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and then occasionally, I, I think I told you before, my mom is an art teacher. And so every city we ever went to growing up, I was drugged through, you know, every museum, art museum, <laughs> singing and screaming usually. Um, yeah. But, you know, I forget that sometimes that art piece is walking through a mirrored tunnel, right? Where it's mirrors and you look at things and, or a room full of the balls that reflect or, you know, we've done. And so to see sculpture, yes, I get that. But sculpture that serves as habitat. Yeah. It's like living becomes right? a living <laughs> and thing. It becomes a solution, right? So even yeah. the artwork talking about the danger and the in potential, I don't want to say inevitable, because I just think it's the potential future. We have a choice. But looking at the potential future, even that piece of art says, guess what? I'm going to show you the solutions. I'm going to be a solution by increasing yeah. habitat for corals, which then, you know, have not only just for fish and stuff, but they help with flooding. And they do help actually a healthy coral will keep you will reduce sea level rise. There's, you know, oh. yeah, yeah. Healthy coral. I'm a little vague on that kind. Of, I'm not a oceanographer, yeah. ocean person, but uh, I know when they talk about like tsunamis and they talk about waves and stuff. And the, those areas with healthy corals are um, actually had less damage inland. I've read that somewhere. But oh. so now he's become a solution to climate change, plus absorbing carbon and all the other things that they do. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I kind of have two divergent thoughts at the moment, but one is thinking about how this sculpture is becoming a living thing. And if you look at, he has, a, I invite everybody to go to this guy's website. We'll link it in the show notes, but there are so many pictures of ones that have been completely covered in coral and, oh. and they're not even recognizable anymore. And so that really makes me think of and then you mentioned the, the the organic shapes in the wall kind of reminding you of the decay as well. And it makes me think of, you know, in the end, no matter what happens, like the earth is going to, it, it, it's going to figure it out, itself out. You know, once we're all gone and we're not making those, those yeah. damaging things to the environment, the earth is going to replenish. It's going to reju rejuvenate. It, it's done it before and it's going to do it again. And it might do it, you know, many more times before it, you know, the sun explodes and then it's all gone. Yeah. But, you know, it's like nature will find a way to just still exist and live and that's over that's a, humans. That's a really interesting point. That's really interesting. I hadn't even thought of that about in the end. Not only does it exist, or not only does it sorry, does it continue, but it eventually overcomes the damage that we've done, right? It, yeah. It eventually will, like you said, it's unrecognizable. So the human figure one day here will be unrecognizable, covered by um, <gasps> nature. Oh, I just and, had the thought that we, you know how like fossils and whatnot become fuel? Like, what if our bodies are going to be the fuel for like future <laughs> Future races on the planet, future. like <laughs> that end up like digging the oil and I know. Like, we do this again. <laughs> they surely they won't do it again. Maybe right, like, but I don't know. Sorry, that freaked me out for a minute. Right, right. <laughs> you know, this is like around. It's a cycle. I mean, they say you know history repeats itself, man. Like <laughs> yeah, oh. yeah, because it's the organic material. Yeah, that has become the oil and coal and yeah yeah hmm weird um i just i can't get that picture out of my head for some reason i'm just i have this picture in my head of like everything being like humanless and then us being i don't know i i need to stop okay the second divergent <laughs> thought <laughs> this is when cindy gets lost in her imagination and can't pull <laughs> back in <laughs> happens too many times in a day the second thing i was thinking of was so these these sculptures are becoming a solution they are replenishing coral they're helping the environment but then i saw one thing that said the museum of underwater sculpture has a goal of serving 50,000 visitors in a year or or like it was something like the year or whatever they want to bring people in and to like mm -hmm. 
visit the museum. Mm. And so then I'm like, are all these people going to be then scuba diving and then disrupting mm. the new coral environments? And is that going to, do you know anything about that? No, impact? I don't know how that, cause I guess I hadn't thought about how would you view it? You yeah. would have to get in the water, right? It has to mm-hmm. be an immersive viewing. Then I also wonder all those people traveling, right? Yeah, a lot of airline tickets. We have a lot of cars running. We have a lot of, you know, what is the impact, the environmental impact of wanting your art to be seen? That's a commentary on environmental impact. Yeah, and it's outside. It's it's in it's on an island that you know it's not probably not easy to get to to Cyprus. Uh, I think Cyprus is an island, isn't isn't it? It's like in the Mediterranean. No, no, I I'm prepared for art, not for geography. <laughs> This is one of those things I should have looked. I'm pretty sure because I studied like Cyprus ancient art at one point in my life. And I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's an island. Okay. Oh, yep. It's an island. Okay. We looked it up on Google Maps. Because we can start again. Ready? Cyprus is an island. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it's, that's not an easy part of the world to get to from over here. You know, in the middle of the Middle East, basically, though, in that whatever day this is, Mediterranean Sea, I guess. So is it, are we counteracting? Uh, all of the good, good deeds. You know, going that is a, it. that is such a topic. And I, and I think that that's something climate deniers, um, climate change deniers like to throw back like, Oh, right now, uh, as of the recording, they're having the, um, was it the COP 27, the, the climate summit. What is COP? Yeah. The climate change conference. COP. Clearly this must not be in English originally, but <laughs> Um, oh, Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate. Anyway, that's happening right now in Egypt. And so, of course, people from around the world are flying into Egypt to have this conference on climate change, right? And there's a lot of criticism saying, you know, people around the world, like leaders, world leaders and, and journalists and report, you know, and all the carbon emissions that you need that you create to get there to talk about what are we doing about climate yeah. emissions, <laughs> And I, I don't, you know, part of me says, well, this is what you have to do now until it gets better, right? This is, these yeah. are our only options. So I think, is it worth flying to Cy- flying to somewhere near Cyprus, taking a boat to Cyprus, getting in the water and disturbing? Is that what we have to do? It's our only options now. So is it what we have to do to try to implement a bigger change, right? Because yeah. of course, coming out of these conferences, the COP27 will be you know, big changes that governments make, that people in power yeah. will make based on promises they make at these or or pressure, <laughs> pressure from worldwide pressure. Um, and uh, that has to be greater than not meeting at all. So is it worth it? I guess that's the question. I don't know the answer, right? Like I yeah. can effectively argue both sides, I believe. <laughs> yeah, I feel that way too. I mean, and, and it's not just this, it's, Every decision we make right now, in just our everyday life, there is this, this trade-off. There is this, oh, okay, well, I do this good thing, but then that is messing up this other good thing. Yeah. And you're like, well, what? Yeah. what is this? Yeah. What is the good choice? And and it becomes difficult, too, with the things I didn't even know. So pretty, in, I mean, I, I've worked in the environmental industry for 22 years, and I still learn stuff every day and researching when I'm writing articles Mm -hmm. for myself or for other uh, publications where I'm like, wait, microplastics, we need like a credit card a day, (laughs) (laughs) water inhaling and eating a credit cards worth of plastic a day. So then I look around my house and I see all the things I have. My organic lettuce comes in a giant plastic clamshell that can't be recycled. Yeah. What am I going to do? Right? Like, <laughs> do I stop buying organic lettuce? <laughs> yeah. And is it, is that, what's the trade off? Right. And because I can't have this plastic and I got to get, and I think it can become something that's just, you know, it becomes so overwhelming. I mean, I'm one of those people who easily becomes over, overwhelmed. If I have too many yeah. things to do in my head and it starts to swirl, like I just Same. stare at the wall, yeah. right. For a long time and I don't do anything. <laughs> And so I, I worry that people will start to, the more we learn, the more frozen in the decision and everything I do is going to be wrong. So what can I do? You know? Um, yeah. And like you said, there has to be a trade-off sometimes. 
I mean, until we can just start demanding that organic lettuce not be put in a stupid plastic container that can't be <laughs> recycled, which <laughs> again, there are state governments. I know California, we have a anti, you know, or not anti, we have a, uh, they just passed a law that sing, phasing out single use plastics. So those yeah. people with the plastic container for your lettuce, they're going to have to figure out what else they're going to do. So. Yeah, that's I, as you were talking, I started to think, yeah, it seems like it's the governing bodies and the policymakers that are the ones that have to regulate this because, and then all of us just walking around being guilty about everything that we're doing, uh, that doesn't feel well, like it, a good thing to, <laughs> to do some either. Of it is, some of it is really just a society change. Um, so when we moved to California, plastic bags were a lot. You can't. Yeah. Um, you can't just use single use plastic bags. If you get the plastic bag from the store, it costs you like a dime or something. And then you reuse these. They're strong and thick, right? Mm -hmm. But if I forget my plastic bag, I'll be like, no, just, I got like seven items, just pile it in my arms and I'm going to go. And I walked out of the store with my stuff. And the first few times I did that, I thought this feels so wrong. Yeah. So wrong. Someone's going to stop me at the door with me and my, you know, seven items. I think you're stealing them or <laughs> something. I'm, you know, like I'm stealing, right? I yeah. felt terrible. Now I'm like, just, I forgot my bags. Just put everything back into the cart after you ring it up and I'll just leave and I'll put it in my car and then I'll, you know, go home, get my bags, bring them down. Like, yes, this is mm -hmm. a pain, but it's normal now. Yeah. It's normal. You know, when I go back to visit my family in Idaho and I, I go, oh, I just have three things. I'll just carry them out. And they look at me like, no, let me get you a bag. No, really. I don't need one. <laughs> Here's our single use <laughs> plastic, right? I'm like, some of it is just that we have to start, you know, giving ourselves a little bit of grace to say the way we've done things doesn't have to be the way that we do things. And if it feels weird, that's okay. You know what? Eventually, it's not going to feel weird anymore. Eventually, you're going to get used to just carrying your stuff out at the grocery store. Yeah. Uh, bringing your bags with you. You'll remember. It might take you 18 months, but you'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> might speak from experience on that one. <laughs> Yeah, we went to Seattle for vacation this summer and they have the bag thing there too. And it was, it did, it felt really weird just walking out with just right? stuff. But yeah, I started, after, we were there for like 11 or 11 days or something. And by the end of it, it was starting to feel like, oh, this is just, this makes a lot of sense. Why don't we do this in Texas? Right? Like, why yeah. do we, we just, because we always thought we needed plastic bags, you know, and they'll, they'll put like one box of crackers and two cans of soup in a bag. And then, you know, so you, you end up with 20 bags. Cause I don't know, yeah. they want you to feel like you got your money's worth. <laughs> um, <laughs> why? It's so weird. Yeah. You know, we just, just cause that's what it feels normal, but, and there's just all sorts of stuff like that, that I think we, it's uncomfortable. Change is so uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but that one I was forced into it. Right. Yeah. State said no more single use plastic bags. So I got used to it. Other choices that we've tried to make at home where it feel really weird and are uncomfortable, you just keep trying, you know, keep going. And you know that one day this will feel normal too. So. Yeah. What are some of those changes that y'all have made? Because you've already oh, made the decision. So now I can be like, oh, this is the one I should do. Yeah. <laughs> As Nicole you know says to do it. Yeah. Well, we're doing one that's kind of a, that's super uncomfortable is we're becoming a one car family. Mm. getting rid of our car and it's this uh hyundai santa fe that's got like the third row and the big <laughs> moon roof you know and mm -hmm. i mean it's like 12 miles a gallon <laughs> uh four-wheel drive you know uh leather seats <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're keeping um our it was our daughter's actually her used prius that we got her to go to college but she moved in with her boyfriend. They can only have one car. Now we have this extra car. Anyway, my car is such a status symbol. I am so uncomfortable yeah. that we're going down to one vehicle when we have three of us, right? So my son's uh, going to graduate high school this year and he'll be going to community college next year or I think. Anyway, he'll be going to college next year. So either he'll leave and he won't need a car or he'll stay living at home and he'll need one. And just that like anxiety that one of us might have the car. And someone else might need to go somewhere. <laughs> what am I going to do? And then also the other flip side of it is like, I'm going to have to go out into public all the time in a used Prius. <laughs> and I mean, isn't that crazy? Yeah. It's not even a pants car. I don't even own a Porsche. By the way, I'm in LA. My Hyundai Santa Fe is at the bottom of the ring. <laughs> <laughs> our, you know, our garage down there is like, 
Porsches and femurs, and I'm just like, oh, what is this? But I know, but it worked. <laughs> it was dog, and he used to be in the third row. Anyway, so I think you know something like giving up the two car family. Yeah, we work from home. Um, when we do work out, we walk. We walk to the co working space. We hardly drive ever. Uh, there's public transportation to a lot of places if I want to, and we have tried using it. That's the other thing we've done is we've really tried to use the bus. And I got to tell you, the bus in LA is an experience. <laughs> I love LA. Don't get me wrong. But there are some times that I'm on the bus where I'm like, I'm going to die. <laughs> I might be killed. I'm sharing my Google location with my mom. <laughs> she can tell them where to look for my body. Um <laughs> Uh, but those are the things like we want to do good, but then it's just like, we feel physically unsafe if we, do, you know, it's like, those are the bar- real barriers. I know. And then the more people who ride it though, then the safer it yeah. gets, right? So but if you don't ride it, so it's this use, you know, if you don't ride it, then they cut, they cut routes and then I can't get to where I'm going. So now I don't ride it. And then they don't, you know, and then it becomes unsafe yeah. because now it's just the homeless people riding up and down Santa Monica Boulevard in the cold, you know, or the heat and which is a whole nother topic of, you know, needing solutions. But yeah, I think not having two cars is so uncomfortable and it's ridiculous. We don't need one, yeah. um, but it terrifies me. In fact, we've been planning on doing this for like four months. We've got to clean. We're going to, you know, like detailed. I've done the thing. In fact, I, I commit. I will do it after. I will do it before. Okay. Well, it has to be renewed in again in December, early December. So that's our deadline because it's you ridiculous. It. Yeah. Um, <laughs> That is, I think that's probably one of our biggest is changes that we're making. That's really, really uncomfortable, even Mm. though it's just a perceived uncomfort, you know, we still have a car, we're not going car free. We'll still have one car. (laughs) Yeah. I'm like, oh, we have two cars. We both work from home and I'm sitting here drinking a Starbucks and I'm just like with a straw in it, but I I needed to stir my... (laughs) But I, I needed think- to stir my sweetener. I was like, I need the straw because how am I going to stir my sweetener? Because they don't have the sweetener I like anymore. So I have to bring right. my own. And then. Is it the like, sippy? Is it the sippy cup lid? Yeah. Oh, I hate mind. that. It is a sippy cup say, lid. I the sippy cup lid actually uses more plastic than the old lid plus a straw. Really? It's a, so Dream I have a washing. sippy cup lid and a straw. Yeah. Well, you're just going to hell. But <laughs> <laughs> And I'm putting sweet and low, which is sin in a lot of people's eyes well that's yeah that's a <laughs> climate change thing. no i'm um, sure that's no, impacting that, climate change too then the whole oh. you know like the sippy cup lid and then you find out it's more plastic like oh i've been greenwashed again but yeah oh that's i did not know that that is fascinating i know i know there's <sighs> so many things like that, that yeah um, are so deceiving and yeah again we've we've been living inside like the artwork the walls are solid Mm -hmm. and i think we're starting to they're starting to decay open or whatever the maybe not decay maybe yeah uh, starting to open i i I would like to take a sledgehammer to it actually i think if people had the information we could make better choices and feel empowered doing it that's the other thing is i think the car, I need to flip it, right? It's all your interpretation, right? I need to flip right. it and say, I'm not a victim of having to go to one car to try to save the world. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you sound like a it was victim, your choice. A hero. <laughs> um, but it's my choice. I don't need It's your choice. It. Yeah. It's an albatross, right? Like I pay more on it. I have insurance. I have, you know, because I have two teenagers that I'm, you know, 17 year old and 22 year old. Wait till kids start driving your insurance. Um, yeah. It's, this is an albatross. Why am I doing this? I could be free of it. And I think there's a lot of choices like that where we we looked at it where I'm just doing this as part of a consumer, you know, consumerism. And mm-hmm. I could let go of this and feel so good. Yeah, I was listening. This is related, but un- unrelated at the same time. I'm listening to Big Magic. It's the third time I've listened to it, but by Elizabeth Gilbert. And um, so she said a line that kind of stopped me on our tracks yesterday, probably because I was thinking about the environment so much, but she was talking about someone who was like becoming an ice skater in their forties, just because they did it when they were a kid and they loved it and the freedom it gave them. But she was like, I think that quote was something like, she felt like she was doing something for once in her life that wasn't just in order to be a consumer. Mm. And 
And then I was just sitting there as I, I'm listening to it as I'm consuming. <laughs> I was driving from Target to Dollar Tree, you know, to, <laughs> to consume things. But yeah. And then it I is, look around and I'm like, oh, yeah, my whole life right now. It's, which is somewhat of a trap, right? Which is, you know, mm-hmm. another thing is the American economy is completely built on consumerism, you know, on, on yeah. it only functions if we buy more this year than we did last year. Um, it's the only way the economy grows. And, you know, uh, that is one thing I think it's, again, when we look at it through the environmental lens, we say, well, wait a minute, what if I stopped buying stuff? Maybe did more experiences. I went to the theater instead. Yeah. I mean, these things could really bring us joy. You know, I think we could, I think there's so many choices we can make that if we, even if we make them because of climate change, we end up benefiting in so many other ways. Yeah. So many other ways. Yeah. Create and and engaging in creating things like this artwork that we're looking at that. Right. It's like. Yeah. All of it wrapped up into one. Okay. Well, what else? Okay. Is there anything that you're feeling left unsaid in this? In this artwork, is there any part of it that that you've been kind of looking at that we haven't discussed? Or I think so. I think that I'm really glad that you brought up the point that in over time it gets overtaken by nature. Mm-hmm. I think that is the end, right? The yeah. end result. And whether we're looking at, like you said, we might up this up, but guess what? The world will go on. Yeah. Um, and that's the end result or the end result being that we, you know, make changes that improve nature, that improve our relationship with nature. You know, it's, the, it's still the end game. Like one of the two has to happen. Yeah. Right. Nature will either come back and take over after we're gone or we will develop a relationship with respect to nature, to, you know, to our environment and respect and a, and a willingness to have a, to cohabitate with it in a way that we don't end up demise. <laughs> um, but I think that's the end, right? The end game mm-hmm. is the same. Yeah. Uh, which is the artwork, right? Yeah. Like it kind of tells a story. It tells this whole story from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, and while you're viewing it as it changes in the, in the water level changes and it's very dynamic. So I guess that's awesome. The, yeah, the whole experience is is kind of amazing. I'm glad we picked this one. This I know, great. me too. I'm like, you just summed this up so beautifully. Like, we didn't talk as in depth about the artwork, maybe as I have in some of the other episodes, but I'm not mad about that because it all ties in and it's all related. And I think that um, it's, well, and it's I can a, see everything that we talked about reflected back when I look at it. It's a it's a dynamic piece that requires a dynamic conversation. Indeed. Love that. Okay. So uh, <laughs> excellent end to the conversation. So um, can you tell our listeners where they can find you online? Yes. So I am, my website is the biggest place, Nicole Pearson, oh. N-I-K-O-L-E. My mother was an artist, so I'm stuck with <laughs> N-I-K-O-L-E. <laughs> P-E-A-R-S-O-N <laughs> dot com. That's where I'm mainly at. You know, I'm trying to do TikTok. I'll let you like. Okay which is just Nicole Pearson official as well. So nice. if you remember Nicole Pearson, you can find me. Okay. Not many of us out there. I'm trying to do TikTok too, but trying in terms is just me thinking about maybe I'm going to do it. Yes. That's exactly <laughs> where I'm going to all the people. <laughs> <laughs> like I will ease into that. I will think about it. I will imagine it. Maybe eventually I will actually do it. But yeah. Not I, have a, I, I do want to use that because again, I want to you know be able to educate people, not just about what yeah. we can do, but about all the great things that are out there that are available to right now and that people need to start taking advantage of. And, you know, again, Shell and Exxon will be just fine. So let's uh, figure out how we can make the best of awesome. all of this. Do good. Do good while also uh, finding benefits. So awesome. Like that. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you so much for listening to Art and Self. And if you loved what you heard, please consider leaving me a rating or a review on iTunes and share this episode with one friend who you know needs to hear what we talked about today. You will find links to the artworks that we discuss over at the show notes at artandself.com. And you can also join my email list to get notified of all of the new upcoming episodes. And you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at Cindy Needs Art. Thank you so much for listening and have a wonderful week. See you next time.